let's just hold off. Okay, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Please give us one more minute as we let people into the room and, um, and then I'll officially welcome you. I hope everybody's having a wonderful summer. All right, I'm going to get started and I guess people will just enter as they will. So, hi, my name is Susan Aronson and I am the Director of the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub. And I'd like to welcome you to, this is our eighth Mindaroo webinar on data and data-driven sectors. And um, you can see our partners on the invitation. Uh, before I announce the speakers, um, let me reassure you that Zoom rules, while their terms have changed, uh, their rules regarding this type of webinar have not changed. So your data will not be used to train Zoom's generative AI model without your direct consent. So just want to reassure you of that. Okay, so today we are pleased to have two guests. Professor Anu Bradford, who is the Henry L. Moses Professor of Law and International Organization at Columbia Law School, Columbia University Law School, and Patrick LeBlanc, who is Associate Professor and the C.N. Paul M. Tellier Chair in Business and Public Policy at the University of Ottawa in Canada. Okay. Professor Bradford's new book, Digital Empires, The Global Battle to Regulate Technology, is focused on three competing regulatory approaches, the American market-driven model, the Chinese state-driven model, and the European rights-driven regulatory model. So I'm gonna shut up now. Professor Bradford will speak for 15 minutes. And then Professor LeBlanc will provide 10 minutes of comments. And then we open the floor up to your questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A as soon as you can, so we can make sure to get to them. We want to have as many questions as possible. Professor Bradford. Thank you so much, Susan. And um, hello, everyone. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share an early conversation uh, about digital empires with you. So um, to, to get us started, the, the basic assumption underlying the book is that there is a growing consensus that a digital economy needs to be regulated, but there is no global consensus on what that regulation ought to look like. So in the book, I argue that we can, to some extent, simplify the world, but we can identify three primary approaches for digital regulation. And as Susan said, one is the American market-driven approach. Then there's a Chinese state-driven approach. And then there's a European rights-driven approach. So very quickly, how do I understand these models? So the American market-driven model focuses on free speech, a free internet, and incentives to innovate. It really takes a, a strong faith in the self-regulation by tech companies and reserves a very marginal role for the government. So it is more of a techno-libertarian view of the world that is believed to enhance both democracy and economic prosperity. The Chinese take a very different view. It, uh, the China is, uh, is focusing on a state-driven attempt to make China a technological superpower. In addition, the Chinese government leverages technology to further censorship, political control, surveillance, and propaganda. The Europeans uh, are taking a, what I call a third approach. They, they refuse to believe that the American approach is consistent with European values, nor is the Chinese approach. So the Europeans have more of a human-centric approach to digital regulation, where the fundamental rights of individuals, the users, the citizens, the consumers is central where the EU is focused on preservation of the structures of democratic society, and also believes that we need to enhance more fairness, so more equitable distribution of the gains from the digital economy. So why do I call these three 
uh, uh, regulatory models and the jurisdictions that embrace these models empires. And the idea, this metaphorical reference is that these are like the, the modern empires of the internet era, whose regulatory models are not confined to their own jurisdictions. Instead, they are exporting their regulatory models across the global digital space. So we have the Americans exporting their internet freedom agenda and primarily exporting the private power of their companies that are now uh, uh, all over the world where the, the digital citizens in all continents are basically using American companies' digital products and services. Then we have the Chinese that are exporting infrastructure power. So they are building digital infrastructures, including telecommunication networks across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and so forth. So what are the Europeans exporting? They are exporting their digital regulations through a phenomenon that I have called previously the Brussels effect. So the Europeans are really taking the lead role as the regulator of the digital economy and providing the model for those governments that want to replicate what the EU is doing. So this already suggests that we do not see the kind of splinternet or balkanized global digital economy where we have clear spheres of influence that are confined to certain regions, for instance. Is that we have a lot of battleground states where the influence of all three digital empires is being felt. There are many markets that have American technologies, the tech companies, Chinese infrastructure, and European regulator regulations governing those companies and that infrastructure, sort of bringing a different layer to that digital governance framework. So these models also clash in many markets. So we have a horizontal battle uh, between the three digital empires, but we also have vertical battle when all the digital empires are battling the tech companies in their own markets. And in the book, I explain how these, uh, these various digital battles intersect and shape uh, the global digital order. But in the interest of time, let me now jump to the question that probably most of you have. Is there going to be a winner in this battle? Who wins the horizontal battle and who wins the, the vertical battle? So the, one of the, the, the first conclusions that I want to bring to you is that the American model is losing. I think there's very little faith anymore in the self-regulation of tech companies, and there has been a backlash uh, around the world. So in many ways, I think that the, the Americans with uh, laws like Section 230 got more than they bargained for. So ultimately, that has really challenged the democratic structures within the US itself. And often these US tech companies have caused havoc around the world, which has then prompted this uh, urge to regulate and rein in the power of these tech companies. Even the Americans themselves are now losing their faith in this techno-libertarian ideals. And there's growing public opinion calling for regulation and attempts in the US Congress to uh, introduce more regulation. So if the, the, the market-driven regulatory model is losing, um, I think the, both the Chinese and the European models are doing well. So first of all, the European rights-driven model is doing well in the democratic world. There's an attempt to replicate many of the key legislations, including the GDPR, including then the various antitrust regulations that, that the Europeans have uh, introduced. And now, uh, potentially, the soon to be finalized AI Act is also gaining attention around the world. So if I say that the European model is doing well, I see three concerns for the Europeans. So one, which is also a concern for Americans that are considering potentially adopting a variant of the European rights-driven model, is that is this European model consistent with innovation and technological and economic progress? Because ultimately, we don't see any European companies like European Google or Meta or Apple or Amazon. So often, the, the presumption is that the Europeans can only regulate, but they cannot generate technologies. And here the book says that regulation is not, digital regulation is not the reason why Europeans are not generating world-class tech companies. There are a host of other reasons, including shallow and disintegrated capital markets, punitive bankruptcy laws, uh, um, 
a lack of ability to attract the global talent that have been fueling the American tech economy, but not the European economy. So that I am not too concerned about as an inherent weakness of the European regulatory model. But I see two big challenges remaining for the Europeans that really give me deep pause. The first of those two is that I don't think the Europeans necessarily are overdoing the regulation to the extent that it curtails innovation. I'm more worried that the Europeans are underdoing it, that they are not regulating enough, or at least they are not implementing their regulations in the way that we see concrete outcomes in the marketplace. So the Europeans have a great track record in passing regulations, but less of a great track record in enforcement. Many of us who follow the GDPR very closely know how important the regulation has been on paper, but also know of many inherent weaknesses in its enforcement. So that is something that may make the European model's victory hollow and in practice leave the tech companies in charge, which would be implicit victory for the American uh, uh, market-driven model. The final big challenge for the Europeans is that even though the European rights-driven model is doing great in many parts of the democratic world, the authoritarian countries are not buying it. They are instead turning to the Chinese model. So China is doing very well in providing a model for the authoritarian or authoritarian leaning countries. And there are a couple of issues that the China has done right. So first of all, through its infrastructure power, it has provided many developing countries a path to digital development. They have equipment that is cheap, then that is good. And also China has shown to the world, and this is very hard for the US and its democratic allies to accept and acknowledge, is that China has shown to the world that the countries don't need to choose between political control and thriving innovation. They have been able to combine the two. And that is attractive for many governments that do not want to have enhancement of democracy as the goal of the digital society. So here is now the, the, then the, the final sort of a big battle, the real showdown that, that, that worries me the most is that ultimately the outcome of these battles is that what is really at stake is the future of liberal democracy. And the book shows how liberal democracy can lose these battles in one of two ways. So one way is if the Europeans and Americans are losing the horizontal battle to China and the Chinese digital empire is gaining influence worldwide even more than it has already. So we are expanding the Chinese surveillance state and, and the vision of digital authoritarianism as a governance model across the world. But we need to keep in mind that that liberal democracy is also losing if we cannot win the vertical battle against the tech companies. If the US and the EU cannot find the way to effectively enforce their regulation, the US cannot legislate or the EU cannot enforce vis-a-vis -vis the tech companies. Because one of the outcomes, one of the consequences of that is that we need to concede that the digital economy is all only govern, governable by authoritarians or by tech companies, but there is no democratic governance model that is ultimately effective. And that is the kind of conclusion that neither the United States nor Europe or their democratic allies can leave the world with. So ultimately I provide there an argument for closer transatlantic cooperation, both to prevail in a horizontal battle against China, but also to prevail in the vertical battle against the tech companies. So more to say, but I'm really um, excited to, uh, to engage with your questions. So let me now hand it back uh, over to Susan. Thank you so much, Anu. That was really great. And it led me to come up with a question that I'm, I, I do think this is changing. Um, and what I mean by, so in terms of generative AI, when you're creating a large language model, you're scraping the web. And so you're getting a sample, which means that although these companies have always relied on data, they have to have more cooperation 
in terms of governance from other countries because it's essential now to their future profits. So do you think that that might lead to what you really want to see, which is a, a real, not a fake, exception of regulation to some extent that allows them to source the globe, <laughs> but also holds them in check and points out the enforcement failures of good law. I, I, you know, maybe that's an unfair question to ask now before Patrick goes, but it's something to think about. So I'm happy to take take on that, uh, Susan. I think there's there's more to say probably uh, on that for many people who are on this call. But I think the generative AI presents a really interesting potential shift in the dynamics that I am observing. So one is what I what I mentioned, uh, the, the kind of disturbing conclusion that China has shown that they can uh, combine innovation and political control. We are now seeing China lagging behind the United States in generative AI in part because of the censorship rules. The, the data that you feed these models with needs to be consistent with the values of the Chinese Communist Party that makes it much harder to create these models. So this is a potential for the democratic uh, 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 regimes to vindicate the idea that there is a positive correlation between political freedoms and, and economic innovations. But the second is that it, there, there is a case for regulation. So for instance, we may see uh, a greater influence uh, uh, that the Europeans have globally on the regulation of the AI. Because if and when the Europeans will have the, the AI Act in force, which is expected to be in the end of this year, the companies that want to offer a generative AI in the EU need to comply with European rules. So if they then want to offer the same system they have trained using European data in other parts of the world, they need to continue to follow those European regulations in other parts of the world as well. So if they want to evade the European regulatory standards, they would need to retrain their models and leave out all that data that they have, uh, uh, they have access to in Europe. And often the models perform better when they have more data. And then that would, uh, that would imply that the model is inferior. Of course, you can say that sometimes the European data is not relevant. You can have synthetic data and that, that dynamic may not hold. But I think that's one issue that is already extending the European regulatory approach abroad, which then ought to provide a greater impetus by the US government and other governments to say, well, let's rather not just be passive recipients of how the Europeans want to regulate it. Let's really try to think about the regulation jointly as an international community. There are efforts to do that, but I, I, I think there's also challenges in how much we can really accomplish given the, the different views um, across the different markets. Thank you, Anu. Patrick, looking forward to your comments. All right, uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Anu, for... Um, the uh, the introduction uh, of your book. Um, so I'll say it out loud to anyone uh, who's on this call and anyone else. When when you can get your hands on this book, read it. It is great. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a bit of a cliche, but this is kind of the book that I wish I would have written. Uh, and and a lot of my thoughts and 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 Susan and I have also had uh, lots of discussions about a lot of these issues are in this book. Um, so, but fortunately. Um, uh, and who has done a much better job than I'm sure I would have done uh, writing a similar book. So her book brings together uh, and organizes a lot of discussions and debates and issues about business and governments in the so-called digital economy. So, you know, it, it touches on issues of surveillance capitalism, big tech, tech war, AI governance, which uh, we just talked about, cybersecurity, decoupling, de-risking, etc. You name it, it's in there. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the great contributions of this book is that, you know, there's been a lot written about uh, 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 all these things, many books, many articles, many policy papers, and Anu does uh, a great job at, at bringing together and organizing in, in a framework that actually makes sense and, and, and is able to look forward as to what, you know, perhaps we can expect. Um, on the other hand, uh, maybe a lot of what she writes about is not new for many of us. 
uh, though, you know, those of us who have been following these debates and issues closely, you might say, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff I already know, even if it's organized in a way that uh, we might have, have given a thought. Uh, so, for instance, the idea of digital empires is not a new one. Uh, in a way, Susan and I uh, wrote about the, the three data realms uh, back in 2018 uh, in an article for the Journal of International Economic Law. So this idea of the three realms, three regimes, empires is something that has been around. But again, it's a framework uh, that makes sense uh, for uh, what Anu is trying to do. Uh, so I, in spite of all this, uh, I learned a lot by reading this book, a lot of information, especially on the history of the politics and the economics uh, behind the digital regimes uh, or digital empires evolution, uh, which is, is something that has not really been well covered. Uh, the sort of political economy of how these regimes or empires came about uh, in both the academic and, and policy liter literatures, except maybe for the EU, which uh, Anu has written about in her book, uh, previous book, uh, The Brussels Effect. But for China, for the US, uh, again, it's something that is out there, but was not brought together. And, and certainly the, the three chapters on, on each uh, regime uh, provide this history. And I found that uh, really interesting and very useful to understand how we got here and, and, and where we are going. Um, often the focus, and, 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 and this is something that, that you know, many people talk about, is on the horizontal battle between states, you know, between China and the US, right? The tech war seems to be all of US and China. Uh, and we forget the business dimension, uh, which ultimately is at the heart of, of all these um, issues. And, and that's one thing that Anu in her book does very well. You know, she has the horizontal and vertical battles and, and, and focuses very much on the role of, of business, especially big tech, um, in, um, in the, you know, the, the evolution and, and, and the battles related to the digital empire. So as someone who is always saying, you know, Business does not operate in a vacuum and, 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 and governments, you know, cannot really exist without businesses. Uh, so I, I commend Anu for uh, bringing these two perspectives together, which are really important when we talk about the uh, digital economy. Um, I also like the fact uh, that Anu doesn't present each model as pure. Uh, you know, she says that in fact, they are not pure models. They're not you know, they, they have a lot of similarities, which she discusses uh, in, in the book. Uh, and, and that's certainly the, the contrasting these, these models or regimes or empires um, makes it easier to understand uh, what they are, how they work, how they came about, you know, and, and, and then move forward from them and potentially as, as potential kind of uh, convergence that could happen. Um, the same thing with the criticisms. Uh, so we hear, you know, uh, yes, there, there's these models, but they're not devoid of criticism. And it's not necessarily, their criticisms are not necessarily based on, you know, the kind of the, the, the Chinese model criticizing the US model or vice versa. No, they are the criticisms in and of themselves. And that's also very helpful in understanding, for instance, why uh, the US model, as uh, Anu argues in the book, uh, is is waning, right? And it's not as convincing as legitimate. But it's also it helps understand in a more detailed fashion why you know in some instances the the the, the Chinese regime may not be appealing to some countries while it might be appealing to other countries. And then the same for uh, the EU model. So other than kind of putting all these things together and helping us understand. Uh, maybe what we can call the, the digital order or the future of the, the global digital order. Uh, what is digital empire's contribution to kind of the literature, the academic literature and, and policy debates? Uh, there are two, at least from my reading of the book. Uh, one is that the future of the global digital economy and its governance is uncertain, right? So in a way, she's not saying this is what's going to happen. Uh, she has her likely scenarios, which she talked about. Uh, but she says, you know, there's a lot of flux, but her analysis leads her to, to, to argue that uh, we're not going to see a complete decoupling or a new Cold War uh, when it comes to uh, the digital economy. And, and so she talks about the restraints because of interdependencies between the different uh, empires and especially because of the role of business. And all that again. Let's not forget. This is in a way about political economy, 
and businesses play an important role. So both the horizontal and vertical battles, as much as they move things forward, they also help prevent or will help prevent uh, a complete decoupling or complete tech war and, 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 and kind of breakup of, of the, the, the world economy. Um, and then her, her, her second uh, major conclusion and finding, or at least, you know, uh, that she derives from her analysis is the fact that it's likely that we will move to a digital, bi uh, uh, sorry, a, bi a bipolar digital order. Uh, so in the sense that because the US is, way, is, is, you know, the model is no longer seen as relevant, as legitimate, especially when on, on the vertical aspects related to uh, the re regulation of business, she sees kind of the US moving towards the EU model. She provides evidence that, you know, these things are already ongoing. Some of them is the, uh, what the, the, the US states are doing, which have, adopt, have adopted, uh, like California, for instance, a lot of uh, rights-based um, legislations, and that's putting pressure for, let's say, a, a, a federal one when it comes to uh, privacy protection. Um, and we, we would find ourselves in a world of, you know, digital democracies versus digital uh, autocracies on one side led by China, the other side by the US and the EU. So as I was reading the book and, and its conclusion, I was like, yes, yeah, this is great. This fits kind of what I, 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 you know, I would hope for in terms of, you know, the, the future of the digital economy. But then I was thinking, is this kind of wishful thinking? You know, in a way it's like, did she have sort of the conclusion that she, was hoping for and then kind of backtrack and trying to fit her analysis towards that. And, and, and there are a few reasons why I, I, I'm kind of raising the issue. I, I'm not saying that this is just wishful thinking, but there are things that maybe uh, need to discuss. And one of them is the US, for instance. Can we really argue or think that the US will, you know, to what extent or to, to what extent is it likely that it will move towards the, the European model, right? What if Donald Trump is elected president again, or someone like Donald Trump? Uh, you know, would that really happen? Um, you know, surprisingly, in spite of the closer cooperation with the EU that the US has had under Joe Biden, you know, still, um, you know, a lot of the things that have been adopted by the uh, US government under Bi the Biden presidency, whether it's the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, the then you know initiatives like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, the Global Cross-Border Privacy Rules Forum, digital ad trade agreements with countries like like Japan, we're not seeing the U.S. moving closer towards um, the EU model or rights-based model, right? And it's certainly not cooperating with the EU uh, on those fronts. So yes, there is the EU-U.S. Uh, trade and Technology Council, which is, is leading to bilateral negotiations and certainly China is in the background of that trade council. But still, there are a lot of things that are done that to me, you know, cast doubt on this possibility of the US really moving uh, towards uh, the uh, European rights model. So, um, and then there's the divisions in Congress, which, you know, she talked about all these things. I guess I'm just, you know, interpreting that maybe in, 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 in a somewhat different light, although she just, she does says that it's unlikely, you know, it's, it's likely, she's not saying that this is for sure what's going to happen, but this is a reading of, of what's happening. And then there are the divisions in Congress, which underlie many of the actions that we've seen from the US, and it's not clear that those are going to go away either. So in a way, I'm, I'm kind of questioning or, or, or throwing a bit of cold water on this, this, this bipolar notion and, and, you know, with the US potentially continue trying to have a sort of um, third way, if, if we want to call it that. The second point uh, based on, on the analysis and the, and, and the conclusions is also what about, you know, other countries uh, in Africa and Asia and Latin America, um, where is it possible that instead of choosing either to align with the digital democracies or the digital autocracies, we'll try to stay on the fence a little bit like they've done so far and try to get the benefits of both sides, right? Um, so, um, you know, there, there's question. And also for a lot of these countries, the European model is not cheap, even if they've imported uh, already some of these elements when it comes to uh, personal data, when it comes to the private sector, you know, so in a way, even China, in a way, has adopted some of the EU's uh, model as, as, as Anu uh, mentions and, and discusses in the book. So, you know, it, it does raise a question, would, you know, would they try to seek some kind of hybrid model? 
like you know what what about india for instance india is is, is kind of going on its own and and uh doing things that you know both kind of are similar or at least align with what china is doing and then obviously in 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 other contexts so i'm i'm wondering whether again this to what extent this bipolar world will would uh, is likely in a way, and, and what third countries might do to try to stay on the fence, given in a way the, their interdependencies and interconnections with both, you know, the West and and and, and China. Um, another thing that, um, and, you know, and we we that I didn't see, and I, I would have liked is uh, maybe okay if we if this bipolar world is likely, if if democracy is an issue and it will kind of push. The EU and the US in, in, in working together against, in a way, the, the, the Chinese uh, more digital autocratic model. Um, are there kind of policy prescriptions that um, should be adopted or that the US and, and, and the EU should adopt, right? And I didn't find those. I, I, the, my reading of the book is that it's very much kind of an objective approach to this is the, what I'm seeing, this is the analysis, and these are the conclusions that, that I reach. Not so much in terms of here's what I propose we should be doing to achieve uh, that objective in terms of policy prescriptions. So one question, for instance, um, should the US and the EU uh, provide financial and technical assistance for the rights-based model, you know, and be much more proactive to reach what we might consider certainly in, in Canada, in Europe, in the US to be a desired outcome, right? Um, and then finally, there is a, a big assumption in there that I think we need to mention is the fact that, you know, uh, that China will stay on its current economic and political course, which is not a given either, right? But I think this is an important assumption that, that underlies uh, the book. So uh, these are my comments uh, on the book. I recommend you go and read it. It's, it's, you know, whether you're an expert on these issues or not, uh, it's a great book. Uh, the only last specific thing, and I just also again, Fran, you talk about the US-China battle. Why do you not talk about the EU-China battle? So I'll end here, thank you. All right, I, in general, I would give Anu a chance to respond, but because we are an audience oriented, um, we're gonna start with the questions now because so many people have questions, but thank you so much, Patrick. She has a lot to respond to uh, there and thank you both. Okay, so our first question is, how does the UK's approach compare? Do you, um, it has historically been a middle ground. Anu, do you wanna comment on that? Yes, uh, thank you. So first of all, Patrick, absolutely fantastic comments, and I hope I have a chance to, to comment on those. But let me uh, take the UK question first. So there's a couple of ways that the UK enters uh, this analysis. One is that it is clearly, it has often been kind of between the American market-driven model and uh, the European rights-driven model, pushing Europe towards kind of a less pro-regulation and more free market orientation. And the whole promise of Brexit was that the UK is now free to chart its own course. So how has it used this regulatory freedom? By basically doing very closely what the EU is doing. The UK has its own variants of most of these regulations, sometimes going even more towards pro-regulation as the recent uh, attempt, still now being having second thoughts about it, but to prohibit. Microsoft acquisition of Activision that the Europeans prove. So the UK seems to be quite willing to regulate with its online safety um, bill um, with uh, its uh, variant of the Digital Markets Act. So it kind of seems to suggest that if we take the global perspective, the UK is so aligned with the EU that Brexit against makes very, very little sense. My big regret is that, that what I fear now, and I discuss in the book, that the EU and the US both are now starting to embrace a variant of the Beijing, they are playing Beijing's game and the state-driven model. The EU is flirting with techno-protectionism and techno-nationalism like the US is. And normally the UK's voice has been a restraining force in the EU for these battles. Now there's much more space for the Franco-German dirigist industrial policy style preferences to prevail. So in many ways, the UK's absence is pushed EU a little bit away 
from some of its own uh, priors. And, but at the same time, the global picture being the UK is very closely aligned with the EU. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll move to our next question. What role do you see in the larger battle between digital empires for um, Japan's free flow with trust model, which is, are you familiar with that, Anu? Uh, I don't know all the details. I know parts of that. Yeah, so it's kind of, I mean, with all due respect, it's it's never been, they've never shown how you actually achieve free flow with trust because you can't measure trust. But do you have any comment on that? Let me just very say on the on the general level, because I don't know enough of the details to give the most informed answer to a terrific question, but where Japan fits in this picture. So Japan, interestingly, and there's so much more to say about what happens outside of the three primary empires. And I think their Patrick's instinct was right, that they may not fully align with the sing, single model, but adopt elements of each. So Japan is interesting that Japan is moving to embrace many of the values that the EU is advocating, but it is adopting somewhat less lenient sort of institutional framework to govern these EU style values. So it is between the US and the EU models by often still resorting to self-regulation. So having an element of the US model governing the kind of uh, laws that are otherwise modeled often according to the EU. Um, okay, our next question is about Bitcoin mining. Do you feel like you can comment on that? Uh, well, I am not an expert on Bitcoin mining, so the book tries to do a lot, but it doesn't do really crypto and Bitcoin, so you are not going to. It was one of those that <laughs> I could continue, okay. but but I probably don't give the most insightful answer to those. <laughs> there are better experts on Bitcoin on this call. Okay, thank you so much. So here's another question. So we see competition among countries as well as competition among governments. To what extent do you see those competitions operating in parallel or, if you will, in cahoots? Uh, was, Susan, the question that competition between companies and between governments? Yeah. Are they similar or are, are they parallel is basically what yeah, I think the so question is. There's also, if I talk about the horizontal battle among the governments, and then I focus on the vertical battles between governments and companies. But then I also discuss that there's also a horizontal battle uh, uh, among the companies themselves. And to some extent, we could say that whatever the EU has failed to accomplish through regulations of the GDPR, we have seen more of a shift towards privacy in the marketplace when Apple, for instance, has introduced its do not track feature, which constrains probably meta much more than any GDP find us. So sometimes the tech companies come to the rescue, if you like, of the enforcers by engaging in the battle against other uh, companies and thereby uh, sort of bringing more of a market discipline. So one reaction could be that, well, this just shows that the US market driven model is working. We don't need governments. The tech companies do keep each other check in check. But there, I, I raised this question, I acknowledge that, uh, but at the same time, we would then need to be comfortable with the idea that what is driving these companies is consistent with how our democratic governments want our societies to evolve. And I am not sure there that we want to be at the mercy of Apple taking care of our data privacy as long as it is consistent with the business model and the profit uh, 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 profits of the company. So I don't think they are perfect substitutes, but occasionally their goals do align with, uh, with those of the regulators. And when the consumer's expectations are shifting, these companies are forced to think of their the business models. And I don't think they are anymore in a position where they can um, sort of fight every battle when their user base is also more conscious of and sort of less patient with some of the harms that they are witnessing. Thank you. Um, are you familiar with China's new regulations on generative AI? 
Yes, so I have looked at that at the time the book went to print. So there's there's so much happening in China that that uh, that is not yet part of the, the book conversation. But interestingly, if you look at there was first a draft regulation issued on generative AI, which seems to go further in many ways than the US, uh, obviously, with only voluntary measures, but even the EU's AI Act. And what draws a lot of uh, interest is that there are these goals of censorship, that the idea that we do need to still reconcile the generative AI with the political messaging, and, and these, these models cannot undermine the political objectives of the, of the party. The, the final version then was, um, I think to some extent there was a reaction that this may be too constraining, that we do not have the ability to actually these companies to comply with that. So we saw some kind of a uh, sort of a shift towards more lenient regime, but I think still that the overall conclusion is that China is taking a very different approach. It is imposing much more of guard guardrails, and here's something that we need to also. It goes back to where I ended my remarks: is that we we see that the authoritarians are in much, much better place, if you like to use the word in a more neutral sense to enforce their regulations. China can make its companies to acquiesce uh, with its rules. We don't see the same kind of litigation drawn out battles that what the Europeans and Americans are, are, um, are forced to uh, witness. But China also is fighting the, the, the massive a battle for technological supremacy against the United States. And it, it does constrain the extent to which China is prepared to go in restricting the, the, the AI development in the country. Right, you made that point earlier uh, in your general remarks, you know, it is this catch 22 between supporting innovation, which is gonna require a broader access to information and data from around the world without censorship in order to build effective large learning models. And this questioner asks um, really, what can the US and EU learn from it? Did you want to comment on that at all? What they can learn from China or what they can learn from- it, 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 Well, given the balance of rights, right? In the generative AI um, regulation coupled with the recent information access to database regulation, you know, you sort of saw two steps forward, two steps back in terms of balancing human rights, right? They're very good on protecting personal data if it's not held by the Chinese government. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's it's one of the most interesting features is that this digital economy governance is filled with trade-offs. And those trade-offs don't become as obvious if you only write about antitrust or privacy or you write about surveillance, because ultimately when you bring it together, you realize that you cannot always have all your goals. So the EU is imposing, for instance, with its GDPR, it actually was inadvertently entrenching the power of the big companies because they afford to comply with the GDPR. So the EU was undermining what it was trying to do in the domain of antitrust, where it was trying to disperse the power of the big companies. We see constant uh, trade-offs when it comes to surveillance and data privacy. And I think that particular trade-off is particularly stark today when we are in a more heightened geopolitical environment where even the Europeans are, for instance, relying on US surveillance when it comes to Russian invasion in Ukraine and understanding the value and importance of surveillance information. At the same time, there's a deep held commitment to fundamental right to privacy, which surveillance violates. So I think we are constantly finding ourselves looking into these trade-offs. And one really important one for the Chinese government is that AI is absolutely crucial for China's economic and geopolitical and military future. But at the same time, the stability and political control that enhances the stability of the Chinese Communist Party is absolutely central for the regime survival as well. So these are really difficult trade-offs, the tightrope on which the, the governments need to, need to balance on a daily basis. And the Europeans at the same time too, um, there was very much a focus on the rights-driven model, but now we also are moving towards the need to have more of a strategic autonomy so that the Europeans are not at the mercy of US-China tech war. So it sometimes needs to think about what does that strategic autonomy require? Do we have the luxury anymore to just focus on our rights-driven model in a more pure form? 
So I really invite all of us to, to, to take these trade-offs very seriously. But again, I think it's one of the goals of the book is, and this is something that Patrick's comments recognize, it's trying to show that these are really binary and easy decisions. There's a lot of nuance that go in there. And, and it's, it's very hard to, for me to say that this is how China is going to go about this trade-off. I think they don't know how they're going to solve the trade-off, but the contestation of these competing objectives is constantly present and informing why we don't see as extreme outcomes, but we do see more of a balancing uh, uh, when it comes to policymaking. Thank you so much for that. Okay, this is a question for both of you. How are traditional physical jurisdictional boundaries overlaid into digital empires, which seem largely not subject to existing political jurisdictions? If it was for both of you, do you want to, Patrick, go first, or do you want uh, me to take that? I, I knew I think you should go. <laughs> I'll leave it to you. <laughs> so I think that there's been this idea in the early conversations um, of the regulation of the digital economy that this is a borderless world. Digital world doesn't know the boundaries and that's why it cannot really be regulated. It's not even legitimate to try to regulate a, 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 a sort of impose a territorially bound regulation. And there I would push back and say that the states are still the fundamental unit around which societies are being built. We have a lot of commercial activity, for instance, that transcends boundaries, yet we still have state laws governing. We have conflicts of law and other regimes to way to deal with those those, those questions and legal situation that, that, that cross the boundaries. So I, I still think that we have we see both. We have we see extraterritorial regulation, we see regulations and choices by digital empires having implications outside of their own uh, empires or in the peripheries. But at the same time, we see an attempt to, to redraw to some extent the boundaries along the state lines. And that's why I think we see those conflicts. So we constantly see, for instance, you have US tech companies that are trying to do business in China. And there is no question that the Chinese government takes the view that the Chinese laws apply there. And for instance, Google cannot operate an uncensored search engine. Google tried to create a China specific search engine. Well, that backfired in the United States among the employees, the US government, the shareholders that didn't like the idea that the Google and American companies capitulating to the, the Chinese censorship uh, machine. And Google decided to pull out of that market. So it basically was retreating back to the jurisdictions where it was able to do business according to its values. So I still think that the, the, the state uh, rules matter, but obviously the enforcement of those rules have become blurrier and somewhat more complicated because we see both jurisdictional overlap and sometimes inability to effectively uh, enforce your model necessarily outside of the borders. Um, Patrick, did you want to add anything? Well, the, the only thing I will add, and, and, and you know, in a way, I think it, it speaks to what Anu just, just mentioned, is the fact that in a way, companies are facing these different regulatory environments and different laws and, and different regulations and are trying to make sense of them. And it is a huge challenge. So in a way, if state-based regulations did not matter, then states, uh, sorry, companies would do whatever they want, but that's not the case. And, 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 and we see in, in you know, their, the lobbying in some cases pushes for uh, in a way more convergence uh, while at the same time, less regulation, obviously companies don't like necessarily the regulation, but I think the behavior that we're seeing is because state-based regulations and laws actually matter. Why is it that, you know, as Anu mentions in the book, that, um, you know, the big tech's uh, long dollars and, and resources have exploded in Washington and Brussels? Well, if it didn't matter, you know, they wouldn't spend their money there. In fact, it does matter. Uh, so I, I think, you know, looking at the economics of this and looking at what companies are doing and how they're trying to manage, as Anu said, kind of confirms this idea that, uh, you know, the, the digital economy uh, still uh, operates within uh, state borders, even if there's fluidity across that. And even if, 
there is extraterritorial applications and, and that's part of what needs to be managed. And, it, and states are still trying to figure out. I mean, Canada is the best example where, you know, our trade agreements are completely not in line with what we're doing domestically, uh, interestingly enough. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I'm going to reframe the next question, which is basically about is the US captured by big tech, by the big data companies? Do you think so? Um, in many ways, it is. I mean, there is a reason why we don't see this, this shift in public opinion translate into concrete legislation. So the Congress remains divided. There seems to be an agreement on two things. So China is a problem and that the big tech is a problem. But the Republicans and Democrats don't exactly agree what to do about the problem. So when it comes to big tech, but also we see massive lobbying that for instance has killed many of the bills. And tech companies are very skillful, for instance, using the China card and saying, if you impose all those antitrust regulations on us, we cannot innovate and we cannot help you win your horizontal battle against China if you go too hard on the vertical battle against us. So there's still, of course, there's lobbying in the EU, but what is really interesting and what the American audiences don't always appreciate is that the outcomes can be very different, even if the effort is also directed towards capturing Brussels, is that the research shows that, that the European legislative process is also more open to influence by civil society, NGOs. So there's lobbying, but it's more balanced. And money just doesn't play the same role in politics in the EU. So the, the Congress members are more beholden to the donations that they depend on. So we do see in that sense that the US is captured by, by the tech companies. And one can say that, look, it's less costly for the Europeans to regulate American tech companies. And uh, so there's a political argument too, whereas here, these are still seen as an embodiment of American power and influence that does uh, uh, do a lot in terms of generating economic growth and innovation. So the US has a different calculus, but I, I think the big story is the lobbying story here. Thank you. Um, so um, to win at the horizon, I'm not sure, when is the right word, but um, so this question asks, um, the, the EU puts humans at the center. Um, how, how can uh, the EU get other countries to adopt the EU model? What outcomes could effectively draw other countries to adopt the EU model? Yeah, so in some, some ways, just by doing what the EU does, it provides a template. It's very hard for any government to just kind of sit down and start drafting. This is a very complicated legislative uh, uh, endeavor. And so they look at the leading regulatory models. There's not much of a US model. There is no federal privacy law. There is no AI Act in works. Uh, there is no um, antitrust bill governing big tech akin to what the EU passed with the Digital Markets Act. So they look at what the EU has done. So the EU has earned the reputation as a, a leading regulator that provides these very comprehensive templates. It also doesn't hurt. This sounds very sort of pragmatic, but its influence in Africa and Latin America, it helps that everything exists in Spanish and Portuguese and French, not only the legislation, but the guidance and the court rulings and everything is available uh, in their own language. It's very easy to, to copy the European template. But in many ways, there, there's just the idea that if you look at the alternatives and if you are a democratic government in other parts of the world, you often find the American model too permissive. The US is not legislating and you find the Chinese model too oppressive. So you are often looking for the EU as a guidance, not necessarily to emulate the law as it is, but look at what the EU has done and selectively then importing uh, the elements that you see working in your own jurisdiction. But uh, let me say one more thing, Susan, because this is also a little bit about the policy prescriptions that the Patrick said that the book is not particularly heavy on. It does recognize, for instance, that it's very hard for the US and the EU to persuade let's say African countries to forego Chinese digital infrastructure without providing them with an alternative. So I do mention that it's very hard then to say that you, you have here a, a well-financed good technology and we just tell you not to, not to do that. I use an example when in the book when the US was trying to persuade Malaysia to forego the Chinese digital infrastructure and the prime minister of Malaysia said when the US warned them of Chinese surveillance, to say, what is there to spy on in Malaysia? 
So some of these countries don't share the same concerns about China. So, and, and for instance, they feel they don't have the luxury to worry about privacy when they have massive crime, for instance, that they need to tackle and the fundamental safety of individuals is at stake. So yes, they're more comfortable with surveillance capabilities of their governments. So in many ways, the, the US and the EU need to, the EU is not good with economic diplomacy. So China is very good with that. There's no EU level economic diplomacy in, in many parts of the world. And then there's not the same kind of investments that China has been making uh, across the world. So there are issues that, that the Europeans and Americans could do more proactively. But also let me say one thing about when, when China when the US is also moving towards kind of the Chinese state-driven model with an increasingly protectionist set of trade policies, it's hard to tell these countries not to trade with China if you are pursuing an America first protectionist policy yourself. So the US needs to remain true to its market-driven model and economic openness on its domestic market if it expects the countries around the world to abandon trading with China relying on the opportunities that the U.S. presents that may or may not be forthcoming. That's right. That's uh, well framed. Okay, on a different um, angle, uh, where might the talent you talked about gravitate? To which of those three models? The talent? Yeah. That's, that's one thing that I, I mentioned, that the weakness of the EU model is that, that the EU has not managed to, it has been too focused on regulating, it hasn't focused on these other variables that make a thriving technological ecosystem. And one is that to develop technologies, you need to have talent. So there is, China and the US are doing better on this regard. China is producing tremendous number of capable engineers, but the US I think has the greatest advantage here. It is not recruiting just from the US, but it's recruiting from around the world. It has world-class universities that are often a gateway to American uh, uh, labor market for tech. It still is the place where not only the best universities, but where the deepest pocket to fund the inf innovation exists with the thriving capital markets. That's where ambitious innovators from around, around, around the world come to realize their dreams about uh, technological progress. So that's, I think, is still the superpower of the United States and the moment when during the Trump presidency, the US was curtailing uh, the immigration into the country, I thought the US was really giving up the, the, the greatest asset that it has, and that has made the US as successful as it has been. So there's many ways to measure this brain drain and the, for the US brain gain, but no matter how you measure it, it's absolutely certain that the US has benefited from foreign talent. Just to give you one statistic, over half of the over $1 billion startups in the US have an immigrant founder. And if we, we talked a lot about the big tech today, but think about the founders of that big tech. Steve Jobs of Apple is a son of a Syrian immigrant. Uh, Elon Musk is South African. Sergey Brin uh, is Russian. Um, Eduardo Saverin is Brazilian. Jeff Bezos is second generation Cuban. The U.S. tech talent is very much immigrant talent, and that is something that the Europeans have not been able to replicate, and China is in no position to replicate in the same way. Right. I've seen this myself in reviewing postdocs for NSF trails here, um, it, it, many from China, but many yeah. from all around the world, and it it makes me both proud and sad. Okay, so um, we only have time for, if, if everyone can stay for five more minutes. Um, one question asks about, uh, well, two questions ask about the metaverse and how that might change things. Do you have any thoughts on that? So I don't cover metaverse in the book. And I think that it's one of those that I, I try to avoid the domains because the book is mainly about regulation where we don't really okay. see any serious attempts to regulate yet. It would have been too speculative to see how the analytical framework works. So I think it may not be that I have particularly insightful things to say about metaverse. Not that I don't appreciate the question. I think it's one of those that crypto metaverse, other issues where I think it'll be really interesting to see if the, the framework uh, holds. Well, we're coming out with an article, Adam Zabel and I, on competition in the metaverse, and you'd be shocked to see how many countries already have developed strategies and are starting to develop basic laws. 
I was surprised. <laughs> okay, our last question. Um, when it comes to enforcement of digital regulation policies, are there any models that stand out as particularly effective? But, sorry, if you say that again, Susan, um, regulation. Are there any methods or models that stand out in terms of enforcement of digital regulation that, that we can learn from that are particularly effective? Um, so I think generally I'm I'm pretty uh, sort of skeptical of the, the EU's enforcement record to date. But there's something that the, if you look at the new newer set of regulations that the EU has promulgated, like the Digital Markets Act, an ex ante regulation of market competition targeting the gatekeepers, or the Digital Services Act, which is about content moderation, transparency, and accountability. I'm actually more optimistic about them for a couple of reasons. I think they try to avoid the pitfalls of the earlier regulations like the GDPR. So we talked about the asymmetrical impact of the GDPR, how it, it often undermines the goal of economic fairness by entrenching the power of big companies. So that's because it was relatively more costly for the companies, the small companies to comply. Well, the new set of regulations are designed to be asymmetrical. They impose greater obligations for larger platforms that have both the ability or sort of greater likelihood to generate more harms, but also greater resources to comply. So to me, that is a good as a kind of founding principle. The second is that we've seen that fines are not enough. The EU has imposed about 10 billion of fines on Google. It hasn't unlocked its, its market uh, position. So the new set of regulations are actually trying to go to the heart of the business models. So actually changing the way these companies need to do their business. So as an approach, I'm more optimistic, but again, we need to see what the, the track record will be when these laws are actually being uh, uh, implemented. But if we have uh, the rules like in the DSA where, where companies like Meta are prohibited from engaging in targeted advertising on minors. So you cannot use Instagram anymore for targeted advertising. That is a very different thing for Meta than to pay a high fine to the European regulators. So in that sense, as an approach, I'm more optimistic that we are ramping up the regulation in ways that is more costly. Fines are just often the price of doing business. And ultimately that just shows that the regulators are not playing the game that they can win. So those, I think I'm, I'm sympathetic to the approach. The same thing that it's very hard to me, one of the hardest thing is content moderation. It's so hard to get wrong. You can overdo it or you don't know it. The line drawing is really hard. So the general approach to focus on transparency so that we, for instance, researchers have access to the algorithms so we can, we can have a democratic conversation about the choices these companies are making. I think that is a right approach and probably the, the best we can do because we cannot hand over the moderating role to the governments. I don't think anybody wants that. And that's not feasible. So we still need to do it together with the tech companies, but we need to understand what they're doing and how they're going about it so that we can actually have the transparency and based on that, a conversation as a democratic society, as governments, as civil societies on, on how those decisions are being made for us. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we were not able to answer everybody's questions. So apologies for that. But thank you so much, Professor Bradford, and thank you so much, Professor LeBlanc. And we hope to see you all again soon. And please buy her book if, if, if you're interested in <laughs> digital regulation and comparative approaches. And hope to see you all again soon on our next webinar sometime in September. Thank Adios, you. everybody. Thank, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Terrific questions. Really enjoyed it.